Hey there, and welcome to In the Wonderful, a collection of the sermons and biblical teachings of Reverend Henry Melton, who pastored what is now called Faith Church in Florence, Alabama for over 40 years. Some know him as Brother Henry, Brother Melton, or Pastor Henry. I'm so honored and grateful to know him as Papa. I'm David Holly, and I'm the oldest grandson of Henry Melton. It's such an honor to preserve these timeless recordings so that Papa's ministry can endure and continue to impact lives for future generations, all to the glory of God. So to you who are willing to hear, listen closely to what God wants to say to you today. Uh, I want to speak this morning, and I'm going to read the same scripture that our preacher for the last, last Sunday, Brother Pat Franks, read in Psalm 8, and I want you to turn there with me, Psalm 8, and uh, verse 3, Psalms chapter 8 and verse 3, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him, thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, hast crowned him with glory and honor. Notice, man has had a crown put on him. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. And let's take a look here at Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 6. But one in a certain place testified, saying, that certain place was Psalm 8. I just read to you. In a certain place there was a testimony saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. One translation, a little lower than God. Thou crownest him with glory and honor. Thou didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. Now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus. I, I guess my subject this morning would be men of honor. God is searching for men of honor. The Bible says that it was God's delight in crowning man with glory and honor. What does it mean that God crowned man with glory and honor? Well, this word glory in the original Greek means recognition for what a person is. The appearance of something that catches the eye. This word honor means to fix the price or to value, to esteem. It means to let a person know how valuable they are. And God crowned man with glory and honor and made him very special. There's a built-in need for every single one of us for this, to know that we're valuable, we're special to God. Of course, we know what happened. When sin came, man lost his crown of glory and honor. But I just read to you in the book of Hebrews where Jesus came to this earth crowned with glory and honor because he was special. How many knows he was special? And Jesus came to restore that lost crown of glory and honor and let us know how special that we are. I'm glad. You know, when, when I became a Christian, I had that crown put on me, that crown of glory and honor. And you did too. Every one of you. God restored that lost crown. And let us know that we're very special to God. And God is in search this morning of, for men of honor. In Ezekiel 22 and 40, he said, I sought for a man to stand in the gap to make up the hedge for the land. 
God is always looking for a man. In one verse of Scripture in Psalm, he said, I have found David a man after mine own heart. That's the kind of man God's looking for. He's looking for a man after his own heart. That's why he made man. He made man like himself. And so he said, I found David a man after mine own heart. In the book of Malachi, chapter 4, the last few verses of this book of Malachi, there's a prophetic word, and it's a word that uh, is prophetic in this hour in which we live. And it says in the last two verses of the Old Testament, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Many uh, prophetic Bibles, teachers of prophecy, believe that Elijah... Enoch and Elijah are literally coming back and that they'll be killed and their dead bodies will lay in the streets for three days. Well, there's a possibility that's true because Enoch and Elijah never died, but I don't think they have to come back just because they never died. God can do whatever he wants to do. So I don't think they're coming back for that reason. Hello? Enoch walked with God and got translated. I dare you to try it. <laughs> you may not have to die yourself. <laughs> Amen. But anyway, he said, I'm sending back Elijah. Of course, John the Baptist was that man, prepared the coming of the Lord. And somebody asked him, are you Elijah? No. But the Bible says he came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. I'm sending you Elijah before the coming of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. I like that. The heart of the fathers is turning to the children today and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And so here is this scripture that God said, I'm, I'm looking for a man, and I'm going to turn the heart of that man to his children. I like that. I like that. Steve is one example. We honored him today for that. That's great. And he said, uh, Elijah is coming, which not, I, I didn't think, he, I don't think he meant, Elijah in person because uh, John the Baptist reminded people of Elijah, but he came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. I'm telling you this morning that God's up to something. I'm telling you that it's not business as usual. If you've been reading your paper, if you've been observant, if you've been uh, uh, looking on to what's going on in the church world, there's a spirit that God is sending to the church like hasn't been coming to the church in some time. The Spirit of the Lord is being poured out upon all flesh. We're in the days of, of the latter rain when Joel said that he'd pour out his Spirit upon all flesh. The early and the latter rain. The early rain fell on Pentecost. The latter rain is falling today. And it so happened, let me just remind you if you haven't heard, that the greatest out, recent outpouring has been in Pensacola. And guess what day God chose to pour out that spirit? Father's Day. Lenny LeBlanc, our own Lenny LeBlanc, is in that church this morning, and he's producing a music tape for that church today. He's right there today, been there all week long. He turned them down when they first asked him to do it, but then God began to deal with him, and he said, well, Lord, if they ask me again, I know that you, and they did. And uh, God chose one year ago today... God chose to visit a local church in Pensacola, Florida. They had gone to church to have a good Father's Day service and go home at 12 and everybody eat dinner with their fathers. And they didn't get out of church till 4 o'clock. Then they went back to, at 6. And it's been going night and day ever since. Clara just visited there Thursday night with a group of our ladies and she said, the crowds are getting bigger. The young people are coming by the droves. God is turning the hearts of the fathers to the children. Oh, I know we've got a long way to go. I know there's a lot of rebellion in the world. There's a spirit of rebellion in the world. But I'm telling you, God is up to something. And I want to be a part of it. And I'm not going to miss it. How about you? Mm. I feel it as I talk to you right now. I sense it. 
and let's get let's 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 cut ourselves loose. Let's live detached. Let's not be so attached to this old temporal world. Let's uh, get free from. Uh, I'll encourage you to get out of debt. Don't let debts weigh you down. Do your best to get out of. Don't don't have money uh, burdens uh, if you possibly can. Uh, do like Claire and I practiced years ago. If you don't have the money, just do without. I don't know why I'm saying this. Get out of debt. Get everything that's weighing you down, worrying you off your mind, and get Jesus on your mind, for He's coming soon, and God is pouring out His Spirit upon all, all flesh, and revival is here. It's not coming. Revival is here. Well, in Psalm 112, we have a beautiful uh, description of, of, of how the, the godly fathers and these men of honor, what the effect they have upon their families. Turn with me to the book of Psalm 112, if you will. Psalm 112. And let's look at it together. Look at it. Verse 1. Praise you the Lord. Blessed is a man that fears the Lord. This means a man that reveres God and worships God. He's a blessed man that fears or, or reveres and worships God and delights greatly in God's commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon there. Did you hear that? His seed shall be mighty. I'll tell you, it affects your children. The devil knows that. The devil knows it affects a man's children when he lives for Jesus and is a God-fearing man. It affects your children. I'm an example of how that if a, if a father lives for God, it affects your children. My brother became a Christian when he was about eight or nine years old, but I became rebellious and, and, and as a teenager. And, uh, and I lasted, uh, as a sinner, I lasted until I was almost 21 years old. But then my father's, my father's experience with God was so powerful, I couldn't get away from it. The Bible is right. I said, the Bible is right. The Bible is right. His seed shall be great. Hey, I just thought about that. I'm a pretty great person. God is great, and, and, I, I'm, and I'm becoming more like him, so I'm, I'm a great man. That's what the Bible says. I'm not, gonna, I'm not inflated with pride. I'm more, well, I've got a little bit of ego. I'm trying to get rid of it. Most men have that male ego. But uh, he said his seed shall... I didn't say that. God said I'm mighty. His seed... Oh, I didn't say great. It said mighty. I'm sorry. I'm mighty. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. Now, I don't think that means you'd be rich in money every time. I'm not against a man being rich. In fact, I, I, you know, most people start at one end or the other, poor or rich. I started at poor. I wish I could have started at rich, but I didn't. So. But I don't think wealth and riches has to do anything with money. I'll tell you, contentment and love, unconditional love. That's well, folks. Peace of mind that, you, that money can't buy. Righteousness. A right relationship with God. Amen. Oh, that's a, you're wealthy if you have a right relationship with God. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. His righteousness endureth forever. Unto the upright there ariseth light in darkness. When darkness tries to come, God turns on the light. God shines his light. When it looks bad, when the outlook is dark, God always shines a light. How many have that to happen in your family? Things just look bad, look bad. And all of a sudden, God just turned the light on and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is gracious, full of compassion. A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He, he will guide his affairs with discretion. He'll be wise. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be an everlasting remembrance. Verse 7, he shall not be afraid of evil tidings. I remember when I first came here years ago, 36 years ago, I remember I couldn't go to sleep at night. I, and every time that phone would ring, I was so tense. I had 50 sheep. We had 50 sheep. And I felt the responsibility of 50, God put me here with 50 sheep and said, you're the shepherd. And I remember when the telephone would ring, I, my little old heart would go pitter-patter. Now, what's happened now? What's happened now? I was always looking for something bad to happen, and it did. And I'd panic. You know, when something bad would happen, I'd just panic. I'd hear bad news, and I'd just almost panic. But you know, God came through time after time after time. I didn't have to panic. I didn't have to bite my fingernails. God always came through. And now then, guess where I am now? Every time I hear bad news, 
I look for something good in it. <laughs> God so many times has caused something good to come out of bad situations. And I start looking for the good in it. Are you there? Do you look for good in every situation? He makes all things work together for good. Sickness, lose a job, whatever it may be, accidents. God causes all things to work together for good to those that love Him. He brings light out of darkness. He should not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid till he deceive the desire upon his enemies. I like that. Now look at Psalm uh, 128 right quick. Psalm 128. Blessed is every man that fears the Lord, that rever reveres the Lord and worships him and walks in his ways. Thou shalt eat the labor of thy hands. That means you're going to enjoy your work. Enjoy your work. Happy shalt thou be. The happiest people I know are Christian people. Oh, there's a few that's not as happy. Some of us aren't as happy as we're going to be. How many admits that? Happy shalt thou be. It shall be well with thee. This didn't mean nothing would ever go wrong. One lady in the Bible, her son died of sunstroke. Somebody asked her, how is it with you and your family? It shall be well with us. It shall be well. Thy wife. Oh, I like this one. Boy, what a... Everybody needs a good wife. And everybody said, Amen. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thy house. Next time you see your wife, say, Thank you, fruitful vine, for being my fruitful vine by the side of my house. <laughs> Amen. Thy children shall be like olive plants round about thy table. Wow. You want your children to be like olive plants? You be a God-fearing man. You hang in there. You hang in there. The devil may try you for a few years. Did you know I never promised my mom and daddy one time that I'd ever be a Christian? No, sir. In fact, I hadn't planned to be a Christian because I thought being a Christian was a bunch of do's and don'ts. And anything that was fun, you couldn't do it. Everything that was enjoyable to do was a sin. So you had to be miserable so you could go to heaven. I was going to wait until I got 99 and get saved. But I found out that was a lie. That's, that's a lie. I have fun. I have more fun accidentally than sinners have on purpose. I'm having fun right now. And you're paying me for it. <laughs> Woo! And let's give Jesus a hand this morning. <laughs> Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he wonderful? <laughs> oh, boy. It shall be well with thee. Uh, thy children shall be like olive plants about thy table. I wasn't much of an olive plant for 20 years, but I turned out to be an olive plant after all. <laughs> I, I was a no gourd vine or something. I don't know what I was. I was a no thorny bush. <laughs> but oh, God is so good. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed that fears the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion. Thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children. I'm seeing five of mine already. Got to get to see your grandchildren grow up. Isn't that wonderful? My. Wow, tremendous. I tell you, God-fearing men, men of honor, have a, a powerful effect upon their family and upon this community. Let me quickly mention, I want to mention three uh, that I feel three are the greatest needs of our children. Men, our children, we're, our children live in a wicked world. Let me mention quickly three great needs of children. Number one, unconditional love. Romans 15, 7. As Christ, has, as Christ hath received you, so receive you one another. You could say it another way. As Jesus has loved you, so love one another. Love your children like Jesus loved you. Set as your goal to love your wife and love your children like Jesus loved you. And it, would, it works for wives too. It works for young people. As Christ hath loved you, received you, receive one another. I, I'm reading a book by Mike Bickle, a preacher in Kansas City. He wrote a book entitled pa Passion for Jesus. I've read several chapters. It didn't start off like I thought it was going to. He began to tell his life story. His daddy was a professional boxer. His daddy wasn't a Christian, but there was one positive attribute. His, his daddy, in fact, carried him to bars many times. Many times he, 
He was at the bars in the wee hours of the night with his daddy. But there was one thing positive about his daddy. His daddy had unconditional love for his children. He said, Mike, Mike said, my daddy showed me unconditional love. He showed me how special I was to him. There, a day didn't go by that he didn't hug my neck and tell me how much he loved me. And the day came when Mike was quite young and, and he said, Dad, he said, I think, I, he said, I think I'm getting ready to take up religion. He said, okay, son, you can. He said, but uh, don't be a Protestant. So be either a Catholic or a Jew. He said, there's a whole lot of Catholics. And he said, Jews are rich. So he said, now, I'd prefer you be a Jew, but, uh, but he, said, he said, if you want to, you can be a Catholic. Well, he said, Dad, since Jews are rich, I think I want to be a Jew. Well, that didn't work out too good for him for some reason. It did, just didn't work out. And so then he finally be decided to become a Catholic. And he became a faithful attender of the Catholic Church. And the priest uh, took up a lot of time with him. But one day, one day somebody invited him to a retreat and he got mixed up, you guessed it, with those holy rollers. He did. He got mixed up with them. And oh, he just, he just became a Christian and gave his life to God and he's written a book, Passion for Jesus. Now, this one need of children is not the only need. It's not enough. I've got two more here that are, that are vital. But this... This unsaved daddy that carried his son to the bars, he was so right on that one thing. He loved that boy and let him know how special he was. And it made a big difference in Mike's life. And the day came that he saw God his father as being like his earthly father, even, even to the extent that unconditional love and it had an effect upon his life. This is powerful. This is probably one of the most powerful effects you can have upon your children is to love them unconditionally. Don't love them because they're good football players. Don't love them, you know, if they gratify your, your selfish desires by, you know, making your male ego feel good about, you know, uh, you know being real good. We've got a guy from Florence that's in the U.S. Open, and I hope his daddy, I hope his daddy loved him with unconditional love, and, and I'm sure he did, Mr. Zink, 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 I think it's... And uh, he's, he's there in New York watching his son play in the open this weekend. But the, the second need of children, not only unconditional love, but an, a role model. We should not depend upon athletes to be our role models. We should not even depend upon our preacher to be a role model. We should be that role model ourselves. Hey, your son and your daughter looks up to nobody any greater than they do you. A role model. In 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul, writing to Timothy, and he's probably 40 years old or, or older when he wrote this, he said, Let no man despise thy youth, but be an example of the believer in word, in charity, in love, in conversation, in purity, in spirit, in faith. Be an example. Be a role model. Be an example. Let me say this. One of the greatest things you can do for your child is to love their mama. I can't explain to you how much it meant to me that my daddy loved my mama when I was growing up. It meant so much to me. One day, they were arguing, talk, you know, really yelling at each other. He said, Annie, I guess I'll just leave. We can't get along. That's the only time I ever heard him fussing. I believe that's the only time I ever heard him fussing in my life. I was a little old fellow, about five, six years old. I felt so sick on the inside when I heard my dad say, I'm going to leave. It made me sick. I felt such an insecurity. Love their mama. Role model, number three. Oh, this is a good one. I know it's going to be popular. Discipline. One of the greatest needs of children is discipline. Discipline. And let me say one more time, we don't lose them when they're 16. We lose them when they're six. What was your reaction the first time your little child stuck out his tongue at you? You probably laughed, didn't you? Well, I have to get through life and get you a switch. Huh? After you get through laughing, it may be a little funny. Get your switch. See, we, we overlook little things like that, and it gets, it gets bigger, it gets bigger. Then they start saying no, no. What do you do when they say no? You better do something. That's rebellion. Rebellion. The Bible says in Proverbs twenty two fifteen, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. But the rod will drive it far from him. 
<laughs> Proverbs 29, 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but the child left to himself brings his mother and daddy to shame. I believe that parents ought to be nosy. Nosy. I'm saying nosy. Nosy. I believe you ought to know what's going on day and night. You ought to know where they are and who they're with. Whew. I believe that. Child left to itself will bring its mother to shame. Proverbs 23, 13. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with a rod, he shall not die. You're killing me. Hey, you're killing me. You're killing me. Well, I know how it is. You feel like you're dying, but you won't die. Thou shalt beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. Would it be worth a few spankings? To save a child from hell? You think it'd be worth it? To get rebellion out of that child? Listen, that child is going to have to get that rebellion out someday or another. If you don't do it, the police will have to do it. If the police can't do it, they'll send him to the prison. If the prison can't do it, God will have to do it at the judgment. He'll have to send him to that awful place. Wouldn't it be terrible to send our children to hell because we just didn't love them enough to correct them? Parents are sending their children to hell every day. Hmm. Wow. And hell is forever. And hell is hot. How many believe there's a real hell? My, my, my. I heard a Church of Christ preacher preaching on the radio. He was a a minister of East Florence Church of Christ. When I was a boy growing up, I was a teenager, turned the radio on, and this Church of Christ preacher was preaching. I don't know why I listened to him. It's a wonder I hadn't changed the channel because I didn't, wasn't interested in listening to preachers back then. I heard one three times a week, faithfully, in my day. But I, but I, I heard this Church of Christ preacher say, he said, if you don't correct those children, you don't love them. If you don't correct your children, you don't love them. You're selfish. I'll never forget that as long as I live. And I've been selfish a few times. Now, I, when they get 16, I'm not saying spank them when they're 16. You may have to try something else. But ask God. Ask God. Talk to God about it. When they're little, get that switch. I don't care if the, I don't care if the law does put you in jail. You may go to jail for spanking them, but you'll send them to heaven. The Bible says, as arrows are in the hands of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is a man that has his quiver full of them. What does that mean? As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man. This means that a bowsman can send that arrow in the direction he wants it to go. Children are so trusting and believing. Whatever you tell your children... Whatever you teach them, they'll believe it. My, my parents taught me that they love me, but I don't want to spank It hurts me worse than it hurts you to spank you. Well, give me the belt. I didn't know where it hurt them. It hurt, not where it hurt me. And how many knows it does hurt? That's why I turn most of the spanking over to Clara. We can send our children in a direction that we want them to go. Hmm. You see, the serpent brought sin into the garden. The serpent brought pride into the garden, and pride is sin. Pride is an independent spirit, living independent of God. You see, the serpent was, was once the brightest angel in heaven, Lucifer. He said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I, five times he said, I, I, I'll be like the Most High. And then Jesus said, like lightning, I saw my Father cast him out of heaven. Down he came. He became the devil, the fallen angel, the devil, Lucifer. One third of the angels came with him. And he came into a beautiful garden where a man and a woman was that were made just like God. A man crowned with glory and honor. A man that knew he was special. He never knew what guilt and condemnation. He never knew what fear was like. 
He never knew what sickness was like. He never knew what worry was like. He never had a negative thought. They didn't need clothes because they were so innocent. God clothed them with His glory. But the moment they sinned, they saw they were naked. And they lost their crown of glory and honor and the crown of shame. Shame. They hid from God. Shame. But Jesus came. Our Father God sent His Son. And the Bible says in Hebrews 2, He was crowned with glory and honor. He came with a crown of glory and honor. And the Bible said He came to bring many sons to glory. He came to restore that lost crown. How precious and how marvelous and how glorious it is when you receive the Lord Jesus and you get rid of that condemnation, that old nasty guilt, that old dirty feeling. I'll never forget the night I became a Christian, December of 55, on a Thursday night about 8.30 or 9 o'clock one night. My dad had just got through preaching. I couldn't tell you what he preached on because the Holy Spirit of God had a hold of me. And when I went up to the front and knelt at that little old wore out ottoman, somebody had donated for an altar. The best way I can explain it, and I was a senior in college over here. I was, they, 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 they told me I was somebody. I was an athlete. I was a four-year letterman, letter, letterman on the baseball team. And, and everybody really respected me and, and, and in growing up, I was a little skinny boy, had a back set with the measles. When I was born, I was born <clears throat> with my legs all doubled up, and my mother had to pin my legs up in my diaper for 18 months. I still got knotty knees. Looks like my legs are kind of like a rope with a knot tied in the middle. And I was so full of inferiority, and I was just a nothing, a nobody. But one day, I discovered a gift God gave me that I could throw a ball very good. Just throw a ball real good. Because I could throw a ball real good, they told me, you're somebody special. At high school, they told me, you're somebody special. I began to believe that. I'm somebody special. I began to believe that I was somebody special. I began to believe I'm somebody special. I can throw a ball good. I can do something good. I don't have a body like Charles Atlas. I got one like Twiggy. <laughs> but I'm somebody special. I'm somebody special. I begin to feel, God, let me feel I'm somebody special. And then the night I became a Christian, I knew I was special. In my mind, they told me I was special because I could do something good. But when Jesus, oh, that night when Jesus washed my sins away and I felt like I had a bath on the inside. Have you ever worked hard all day long, maybe recently, and you get, get sweaty and dirty and you go and take a good shower and put on clean clothes? Don't you feel good? How many feels clean when you do that? That's the way I felt on the inside. And since 1955, I've enjoyed that crown of glory and honor. What an honor He bestowed upon me. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon me that I could be called a son of God. And he restored that crown. But you know, before he crowned me with that crown, I had a male ego. I did so many things to try to make myself think I was important. You know, man, when you lose when man lost his crown, he has an ego he has to fulfill. And sometimes it, position. I'm, I'm convinced that some of our politicians have got such a big ego. One of the greatest reasons they want to be president is because of their ego. Not because of money, they're all rich. They pass laws to make sure they're rich. <laughs> Forgive me. Just talking out loud. Thinking out loud. <laughs> and there's so many things. Some men have to get a divorce because of their ego. Some young lady pays them attention. Ooh, 20 years younger than them. Ooh. Boy, they got to feed that male ego so they divorce their wife and get them a young one. Happens all the time. 
There's been many ways that man has tried to feed his male ego. He's trying to make himself feel like I'm somebody special. And man's doing a lot of things today to try to make himself believe I'm somebody special when all he's got to do is let Jesus come in and put that crown on him. It's crown him with the glory of God, the honor of God. When God honors you, when God gives you his glory, that's enough, isn't it? You don't need position. You don't need advancement. You don't have to be first. <laughs> you don't have to be seen. You don't have to be prominent. You can just enjoy being being you. So many times I thank the Lord that I'm not some of those prominent people that can't even go shopping without having to sign a thousand autographs. <laughs> Isn't it good that you can be just you can go on a vacation? Of course it's hard nowadays without nobody knowing you, but you can go and hardly nobody knows you and you just love it, don't you? Just be, be inconspicuous. Just get lost in the crowd. Isn't that wonderful? Get lost. Just get lost in Jesus. My. My. Let me tell you a real man that I'm closing. Let me give you, our musicians are coming. Let me, tell, let me show you a real man. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Made himself of no reputation. He knew who he was, he didn't have an ego. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And the Father hath highly exalted him and gave him a name above every name. You want a, you want a great name? You want a great reward? Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Be obedient. That's a nasty word in 1996. Resist that spirit of rebellion that's in the world and submit to the authority of God. The Bible says the commandment is a law, but reproofs and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. God reproves us because He loves us. The way of life is reproof. That's the way of life reproofs or instruction. It's not punishment. We don't punish our children when we correct them. We correct them. We instruct them. Correction is for instruction. It's a way of life. It's a way of life. I'm glad my dad was tough on me. I'm glad I was afraid of my daddy. Oh, I knew he loved me, but I was afraid of him. Still am. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm Amen. Amen. Would you bow your heads for a word of prayer? So, Brother Henry, Brother Henry, I'm here today, and I don't know for sure that I have humbled myself before the Lord and submitted my life to Jesus and said, not my will, but your will be done for my life, Lord. I want you, Jesus. I choose you. I'm not sure I've done that. I've been to church a lot. But up to this point, I can't honestly say that my life is under God's protection and under God's authority. I'm not sure I've submitted my heart and life, turned it over to Jesus, given my heart and life to God, the creator of the universe, the God of love and compassion, the God that loved me so much He let His Son die for me. I haven't submitted my life to Him to my knowledge and I won't pray would you raise your hand and pray for me brother Henry yes are there others yes are there others are there others I want to submit my life to the authority of God I can trust him he's my faithful compassionate loving father amen just as we close this service I want to I'll tell you I want to pray a special prayer for the fathers and and if you aren't sure that you are a Christian and you submit your heart and life to the Lord, I want you to come down here with them. But I'm going to ask husbands, men, even young men, you may not even be married, but I'm going to ask you too, just to come. We're going to have a closing prayer down here. And if your wife is with you, bring your wife with you because she's one with you. Would you just get up right where you are? I want to pray for all the daddies and the fathers and 
and even the young young men that would like to come. Would you just come and stand at the front here? I want to pray for you this morning as we close this service. And if you're not a Christian, you haven't submitted your life to the Lord, you, you come with them. Let this be a special time in your life this morning. Aren't you glad we're living in a country that honors fathers on Father's Day? I don't know where it started. I hadn't read up on it. I'm glad I live in a country that honors fathers. God honors fathers. Amen. We're going to pray a prayer. We're going to dismiss you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Would the rest of you stand and you pray with us as we pray for these today? I don't know of a time in history when fathers have a greater responsibility. I'll tell you, we're in a wicked world. We have a full-time job loving our wife and loving our children, don't we? It's a full-time job. I'm, I'm thankful that my children are married. I tried to keep them at home as long as I could, but I'm thankful that their responsibility is over. But I feel for other young men that have this responsibility. It's a lot tougher than it used to be. Let's pray. Let's pray for these. Father, Father God, in Jesus' name, Lord, it's not easy. We confess it's not easy to live in this evil world of rebellion against authority. And right now, Lord, I lift up especially fathers, husbands and fathers. Lord, I ask you to give them grace and give them strength, give them the courage, provide them with everything they need, all the tools and all the divine equipment they need to fulfill their role and their responsibilities. Lord, some of these precious fathers have little ones. Give them courage and, and wisdom to, to correct these. And Lord, some have teenagers. I was a rebellious teenager. Some have teenagers that are heavy on their heart this morning. Let them know that your grace is sufficient. Let them know that you will help them as they cry out to you for help, for wisdom, for understanding, for knowledge, and, and knowing what to do and how to go about it, Lord, and how to show love. Sometimes it may have to be tough love. But Lord, give them the wisdom and the understanding, the ability, and help these precious wives stand by their side. Help them to stand by their side, Lord, to stand by their side. Oh, Father, 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 Father. And Lord, those that need forgiveness in this, in this room today, Lord, as they ask forgiveness, thank you for giving forgiveness. You said if we'd confess our sin, you were faithful. You're a faithful God. You're a faithful Father. You're faithful to forgive. Thank you for your forgiveness this morning. Now, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be poured out. Lord, that the Spirit that was upon Elijah, Lord, the Spirit that was upon Elijah, when he stood up in an evil country, Lord, and he said, let the God that answers by fire be God. If God's God, serve Him. If Baal's God, then serve Him. But everybody needs a God. And Lord, I pray this morning that the Spirit that is upon Elijah, let that Spirit rest upon every one of us. Let that Spirit, O oh God, that you're pouring out today upon all flesh, let that Holy Spirit come now. Come now, Holy Spirit, and enable us, empower us, and give us the ability and give us the wisdom and give us that that we need to fulfill our responsibilities. Thank you, Father, for men that are willing to say yes to you, to love their God and to love their wives and to love their children, to give their lives to their families. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Let's praise Him now. Holy Spirit, we thank you. We praise you, Lord, right now. Thank you for listening to this powerful message, and I pray you would allow the word you receive today to produce great things in your life. If you're listening on an audio podcast platform, be sure to leave a comment and give my papa a five-star rating. If you're watching or listening on YouTube, be sure to like, subscribe, click the notification bell, and share your thoughts and any prayer requests you may have in the comment section. Finally, help us continue to spread the word of God by sharing this recording with someone else today. May God bless you greatly. Isn't he wonderful?